In the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Once again, thank you for joining us, wherever you may be, whether you are around the corner here in Capel, Texas, elsewhere in DFW, other places in the country, or a few in other places around the world. We do not rejoice in the circumstances of our doing church remotely and online only, but we do rejoice in the message of the risen Lord today, and we rejoice in your being with us. Once again, the message rings out, Alleluia, Christ is risen, the Lord is risen indeed. That is the Easter message, not just Easter morning, but throughout Easter season or Easter tide, and it is meant to be the message of our lives every single day. As many of you know, the second Sunday of Easter, always a week after Easter Sunday, we always have the same story. We always have what is typically known, of course, as Doubting Thomas. And like every other preacher around the world and in the last 2,000 years, that message sort of writes itself to a certain extent. Do we vilify Thomas for not believing? Or, as I have said many times before, do we relate to Thomas? I certainly do. It would be a very rare person whom I would believe to say that they saw someone rise from the dead. So it doesn't take much skepticism. There's a fine line between skepticism and practicality, and perhaps Thomas can be forgiven quite literally for saying, well, it's nice that you guys say that, but I'll believe it when I see it. And then, of course, we have that weak delay between that first sighting that some of the disciples have, apparently the, the evening of Easter evening, I should say, and then a week later, we have no idea what conversations went on in that week. Something tells me there were probably more than a few among the disciples and the ones that had already seen Jesus and the ones perhaps that didn't like Thomas. So it was a week later that Jesus just out of nowhere appears uh, behind a locked door, and Thomas, at a glance, realizes that Jesus indeed is alive. He touches him, his hands, his side, and that response is, as they say, the earliest Christian creed. Having seen the risen, risen Christ, my Lord and my God. Usually when we think of doubting Thomas and this lesson and this Sunday still of Eastertide, when we still have our white vestments and our alleluias, we normally think of that doubt and belief as being just about Jesus truly and really being raised from the dead or not. And that certainly is the start of the Christian faith. Not just for the disciples, but for every disciple. Is Jesus real? Did, did he actually preach and teach? Was he a real person? Did he truly die? Was he truly raised? That is the start of belief. But there is another aspect to that doubt or that belief, again, two sides of the same coin. I won't go into that this morning, but that line between doubt and belief is razor thin. But the first part of believing is exactly what Thomas saw and understood. This risen Jesus is real. It's really him. That's the, distart, that's the starting point for the disciples and every disciple. But beyond that question of, is Jesus truly raised from the dead? 
is another question of belief. The question is, is that enough for us to base our lives on and our hopes on and our behaviors on? It's entirely possible to believe that Jesus truly is the Son of God who is risen from the dead and, to use the language of the ancient creed, sits at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. It is entirely possible to believe that with all of our hearts and still have a great gulf or gap between that earnestly and honestly held belief and what we do and say and see and choose every single day. It's almost as if the first stage of belief is believing that Jesus truly is risen from the dead. And the second step is believing that that matters and affects our daily lives. It is normal and natural, if not human nature, to sometimes set that aside in the busyness of life. And then when a crisis comes, whether it's personal or family or medical or more recently nationwide and worldwide, to lean on that first belief for comfort and hope. And that is a good and godly thing. The church wants us to lean on the risen Christ for hope amid fear and strength and endurance. That's a good thing. Then we are called to ask the question, perhaps, when the fear is less or the threat has evaporated and life seems to get back to whatever normal looks like, can we and will we still lean on the risen Christ even when we're not quite so fearful? I will borrow a phrase from some of my friends and parishioners over the years. I've heard it many times. But some of my friends and parishioners who have done the hard, personal work of 12-step groups. Many of you have heard it before. You've used it in your own lives, and I will borrow it. It still works. A number of times where I've heard battle-hardened, wise guides in 12-step work say about their own lives or perhaps guiding those who are new in that path and saying something very similar to, well, when you get sober, it's not a magic wand you still have the same challenges. You still may have some of the same problems. Other problems get better. But if you have a problem in your marriage or your family or at your work or with money or whatever else, you may have the exact same problems, at least some of them, sober as you do intoxicated. They don't magically go away but you at least will be able to deal with them sober. A certain sense of peace may come, but all of the problems don't magically go away overnight. So it is sort of the same and believing in and following Jesus. 
any church or preacher, pastor, priest, guide, or guru that suggests, well, give your troubles to Jesus and they'll all go away. Well, that's probably not going to happen. The Holy Spirit can overrule me, of course, and can work all sorts of miracles in an instant. But sometimes it's not a matter of, I believe in Jesus, and therefore all of my problems or challenges vanish. Sometimes it is, I believe in Jesus. He was real and is real. It rose from the dead. I accept the peace that he offers. I want to live not in fear, but in hope. I want his love to to comfort me, yes, but to also shape me and mold me. I give up control of my life to him as I best understand him. And I still will have problems or challenges or dangers or fears they don't magically vanish but we are given help to face them our ultimate fear is taken away our fear of just being annihilated our fear of darkness and death In place of that fear, we are offered peace and joy. Paradoxically, sometimes even in the middle of darkness and death and fear. Think about it this way. It's almost like one of those games we've played them in in youth group and maybe you've played them at dinner parties or something like that. Questions of, uh, would you trade this for that? Some of them are funny and some of them are serious. Would you trade receiving all of the secrets of the universe and knowing them all and having a peace that survives even death Would you trade that for a difficult life? That's not a parlor game or a youth group giggle fest over pizza. That's pretty much what the disciples are faced with in the upper room. Here is the risen Christ. Never mind for just a moment the politics and the Romans and the temple and and the, the, the current events of the day. Here is the risen Christ who has defeated even death, who is the gateway to eternal life and the ultimate answer, capital A, to everything, capital E. Are they willing to meet him? to learn from him and follow him with the ultimate peace and love and comfort and hope, casting out all fear and having new life, not just on the other side of death, but a foretaste of that new life for them here and now. Are they willing to accept that in exchange for not just believing it, but living into that message and sharing it for the rest of their lives. I still remember the church from which I was baptized had on the side walls of the sanctuary, not the Stations of the Cross, but the shields of the disciples and the apostles, the symbols that went with each one of the eleven, not counting Judas. And some of you already know the story. 
there is probably only one who lived to a ripe old age. For everything they saw and touched and knew and understood in the upper room, meeting and touching the risen Lord, outside that room, the world still seemed to spin as usual. Politics, cruelty, darkness, famine, injustice, war, fear, and death. Just because the disciples met Jesus in that locked room did not mean that the rest of the world changed in an instant. Their first choice of belief was to believe that Jesus is truly risen from the dead. Alleluia. Their second choice of belief was to believe that it didn't just have something to do with the rest of their lives, but became the anchor for the rest of their lives. How we do that, of course, is probably not just a sermon for another day, but a sermon for all of our days. What does it mean to say we are a resurrection people? What does it mean to say I'm giving up fear and living in hope and choosing joy? Whether we are at a party or under threat. What does it mean to stay focused on the love and the hope and the care and the casting out fear and the new life we receive from this crucified and risen Jesus? That is much as much of a question of belief as is believing that he is truly risen in the first place. We have been given a new life and a new hope, power to cast out fear and not live in fear and anxiety, to, to, to choose joy based on meeting the risen Christ, no matter what the external circumstances may be. That sometimes is the proof of our creed, of our belief. The risen Christ stands in front of us and says, touch me and see, it is me, I am risen, everything has changed. First, we believe that it truly is him. He is truly risen. And then beyond that, we believe that that can change the rest of our days, the rest of our lives, casting out fear, giving us hope and love and joy and compassion, no matter what comes with the rest of the world.